Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Banking on Innovation podcast. I'm so pleased to welcome as our guest today, Ferdas Badina. Ferdas serves as FIS's Chief Technology Officer. As you're all aware, FIS is a $10 billion banking platform provider serving thousands of banks and really is a, is a critical part of advancing the entire banking industry. And Ferdas is responsible for developing the company's technology and infrastructure initiatives across the enterprise. And he's also the primary lead in FIS's own digital transformation and the focus on innovation and governance and standardization. So Ferdas, welcome to the Banking on Innovation podcast. Thank you, Jody. It's a real pleasure to be here. Great. So Ferdas, you've had a very diverse industry background. In fact, for the audience's sake, you spent several time, several amount of your career actually in both early stages as well as mature companies in the healthcare industry. So share with our audience, if you will, how has this cross industry background better prepared you for the role that you're in today? Yeah, thanks, Jody. So um, I spent a lot of time in the first half of my professional life in the world of uh, venture backed software startups, right? And um, you know, very different world than it is today, different technologies, but some of the most basic principles were the same, which is uh, you lived or died by how you were able to satisfy your customers' needs. Whether those needs were expressed uh, overtly or whether you were uh, working on what people tend to call latent needs, um, you know, there wasn't a lot of room for error in, in, uh, in the world of startups where uh, everything banked on you being able to win over these early adopters and then move to, uh, you know, the next segment of customers and then so on and so forth. And so um, that was a trial by fire, if you will. And, you know, I had about a 50 percent hit rate, which I thought was pretty OK um, and and really enjoyed uh, being on the front lines, doing, you know, uh, all of the things that you need to do to make a uh, get a get a startup to you know get beyond its early days, uh, and that's not just you know building product, but really deeply trying to understand customers' needs and then translating them into things that the product organization brings to market. Um, I never thought I would work for a big company, uh, but then ended up uh, meeting the uh, you know senior leadership at Aetna uh, and. Um, first had a, my reaction was, why would I, why would I go to a company that, you know, has been around for almost 200 years, by the way. Um, but then, uh, it was a fantastic opportunity to take everything I had learned in the world of tech, uh, and apply it to an industry that I care deeply about. My wife is a physician. I've seen her struggle with the challenges in the healthcare industry. And I felt that it was uh, a good place, uh, to spend uh, a chunk of time, you know, in my professional life, multiple years, both at Aetna and CVS Health, developing digital capabilities that, um, you know, that that industry sorely needs. Um, and once again, it came down to, and, and I, I, I think I discovered that, you know, there are certainly lots of differences between the world of, you know, smaller startups, nimble, fast moving companies and large companies. But there's one thing that um, that goes across all of them, and that is, if you don't understand your customer well enough, uh, if you don't live in their shoes, if you're not able to translate their needs uh, into product and achieve what the industry has called product market fit for a long time, uh, it's hard to really make any meaningful progress. And that's uh, that's that's those are learnings that you know have really helped me as I came to FIS and you know meeting Stephanie Ferris about two years ago, it struck me that. Uh, boy, there's this whole set of technology that supports everything we do in the world of finance. And I know relatively little about it, but I know that um, we can bring uh, people like myself and bring the perspective that we've learned across multiple industries, uh, having seen different movies, as I say, um, and understanding, you know, uh, to some extent, at least, you know, what what is needed from a technology standpoint to, to transform an industry and take it to the next level. And we'll talk more about that as we go through the podcast. But um, I'm, I'm really excited to be where I am uh, because I've always enjoyed working on things that impact the lives of millions of people. Healthcare was like that. 
Uh, and now, of course, you know, the financial industry is like that. You know, if it's it's your family, it's your health, and then it's financial security that people care about in their daily lives. Thank you for sharing those insights. Really useful. Uh, you talked about meeting Stephanie or and, and the impact that she had. In fact, I just connected with her uh, just last month, actually, at a bank CEO event. She's so highly regarded from the, the bank CEOs that were present there. Tell me, how has she, in the last two years in, in her role as CEO, how has she imparted a, a sense of greater, let's call it, innovation and customer centricity in the organization? Uh, so first of all, you know, Stephanie comes from the world of finance, so she deeply understands the industry, right? She started her career working at a bank and, and then at a tech company that became WorldPay and then came to FIS. Uh, so she's deeply ingrained. And as, you know, a former CFO, uh, she knows exactly what, you know, you need to do to get, you know, a business to work well. Um, what has impressed me about Stephanie uh, is that even though she's not a technologist, uh, she really gets uh, the disruptive and transformative power of technology. And she has been uh, very vocal and forthright in her desire uh, to, to continue to transform FIS into a very high-performing software technology organization. Um, and so that's what we talk about all the time. Uh, we talk about not how we can be uh, better than what FIS was yesterday, uh, but how we can be as good or better than uh, the best technology companies in the world today. That's a very mm -hmm. inspiring mission. Like when I met Stephanie mm -hmm. and we first talked about that, I thought, uh, wow, what an opportunity, right? Like, you know, uh, this is a company that's been around for more than 50 years. There's not a lot of tech companies that stick around that long. So that's a lot of credit to the people at FIS who brought it to where it is today. Uh, but with that comes a lot of legacy. Uh, legacy infrastructure, lots of data centers, uh, legacy technology uh, that a lot of us still depend upon, not knowing that our our banking uh, runs on some really old systems out there. And so this is an area that is ripe for transformation. And this B to B to C space, which is kind of where we live, uh, is is exactly where I want to be. So I'm I'm not surprised you felt uh, uh, that Stephanie was sort of the right leader for here. It, it, um, I'm not easy to please when it comes to who I want to work for, and uh, I'm delighted to be at FIS. I was a little bit jealous at this event where Stephanie and FIS was getting called out, so <laughs> it was uh, it was nice to see in a positive way. So yeah. let's talk about this uh, this transition. I mean, FIS has such strong penetration across, frankly, the entire banking industry. It allows you to really have your finger on the pulse of the most pressing industry issues. So for us, what are you hearing now from customers in terms of their expectations of a banking platform provider like FIS versus just a few years ago? You know, I, I think the biggest change, and you'll, you'll probably hear me talk about this all through this podcast, is how do you become a part of your customer's life in a seamless, non-disruptive, unobtrusive way? You know, gone are the days when people say, I'm going to go do some banking at my local bank. Uh, and, you know, my father-in-law, God bless him, you know, was doing that, right? Like he would be like, I'm off to the bank. And I would uh, take his passbook, his checkbook, and, you know, he would be off to his bank branch and do whatever he needed to do there, which was mostly probably, you know, chatting around with a lot of other people there. Um, these days, financial transactions, banking, investing, managing your money, uh, that's all part of everyday life. Um, it's been described in many ways by people a lot smarter than me. You know, uh, finance has moved to the point of transaction or banking has moved to the point of transaction. How do you personalize those experiences and make them part of somebody's everyday life in a way that um, doesn't cause disruption or have them go out of their way, but like just seamlessly fits in? And so uh, gone are the days when uh, you compartmentalized your life into I'm going to go. You know, it's, it's very similar to what we used to say in healthcare. Uh, healthcare, 99% of healthcare happens in everyday life. And, and the financial industry is just the same. Most of what we do from a financial perspective, whether I'm haranguing one of my kids because I saw something on their you know, bank transactions that was concerning to me, 
uh, or whether they're asking me for advice on, you know, what should I invest in? Uh, should I go, you, you know, use this product or that product? Um, those are all things that are just becoming seamlessly integrated into everyday life. And I think our customers see that. Uh, and what they want is for uh, partners like ourselves to help solve those problems. I mean, one thing I'm increasingly seeing is customers aren't coming to us and saying, what are your products and what can we buy from you? Uh, they view us as a strategic partner. To me, the difference between a software vendor and a strategic partner is when your customer comes to you and says, here's a problem I have, help me solve it together. It doesn't matter what software I use or what technology I bring to bear. Uh, and I know we're going to talk about data and AI because no conversation about technology could 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 complete without that. Um, and that's you know one of the big areas. So I think uniting with our customers to actually understand the problems of the future and solving them is what customers are coming to us for more and more. I'm sure this podcast will be replaced by two very smart avatars sometime in the future. <laughs> for sure. <laughs> so speaking of strategic partners, one of the things that clients will typically look for in a strategic partner is innovation. They place a premium on innovation. So tell me, Ferdas, how has FIS evolved its operating model and its delivery model to spur greater innovation? And, and what kind of changes have you implemented to, uh, to better deliver on that? So first of all, um, one of the things we believe here is that innovation can happen everywhere and anywhere. Uh, innovation is not the domain of a few chosen people who are put into an, a center of innovation or a center of excellence for innovation. Uh, and that's where innovation happens and everybody else is, you know, as we like to say, BAU, business as usual. Uh, that's not the approach FIS takes. So we started this. I, I, I'm very proud of this. I can't take any credit for it, uh, but it was one of the things that actually attracted me to FIS. We started this program called Future Forward. You might have heard of it. Um, it's, it's something we have talked about in our investor calls, things like that. Uh, and what Future Forward did is it created a structured mechanism by which anyone in the company could bring forward an initiative to drive change, to create improvement, and get a fair shake. Now, a fair shake might mean you get told this didn't meet the bar to actually raise funds and 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 you know, move forward into the next phase of, of execution. But you were never ignored. Um, you know, many of us who have worked for large companies, at least for part of our careers, um, you know, the frustration you feel when I know what to do better, but I don't know how to go about doing it. I think Future Forward created this mechanism within FIS, and it still exists, of course, um, that, that anyone who came to me with an idea, I could say to them, I promise you, your voice will be heard. I promise you, you'll get a fair shake. You will be, your, your concept will be evaluated. There will be a rigorous set of ROI uh, metrics applied to it. You will be part of that process. So you learn more as you go through it. Uh, and that really spurred a tremendous amount of innovation all across the company. Process innovation, technology innovation, people innovation, all across the board. Uh, the other thing we are doing uh, and, you know, when you think about innovation, most people thinking I'm a tech guy would say, oh, he's thinking about AI. I actually don't. I think AI is definitely very important. But I look at all of technology and I look at process and I look at what people are doing to educate themselves all as, you know, innovation across the board. But when it comes to AI, we actually did an enterprise AI week uh, to create that rising tide that lifts all boats and get everybody excited about AI. It doesn't matter if you're in finance. Uh, my financial partner is one of the most avid, ardent, active users of AI at this company, um, and probably more so than many of the tech partners we have um, or tech people we have. And so that's, uh, that's really exciting when you see um, that energy and passion across the company because we've given them the tools to, to bring their ideas and their uh, creativity to life. So for us, you not only are playing an instrumental role in FIS's own digital transformation, but I know you also put yourself in the, in the shoes of, of your customers. And many of them are undertaking some kind of data transformation, digital transformation, core transformation. And, and FIS is oftentimes a part of that as well. 
So what advice do you have for executives and leaders that are leading digital transformations within the bank? So first of all, when we say digital transformation, and I think you do mean it this way, we, we mean it in more of a holistic enterprise-wide sense, right? Yeah, um, yeah. Sometimes when people say digital, they tend to mean digital assets or digital experiences. Um, we actually look at digital as more than that, right? As, as a technology transformation across, um, across FIS and across our banks. Uh, one of the sentences, you know, my colleagues at FIS often hear me say is, we're solving a lot of the problems that our customers want to solve too. Um, and the way we look at it, the, so the first piece of advice I would say is, don't look at areas of technology in silos. Look at it as a continuum. So for example, at FIS, we look at cloud data and AI as a continuum. If you don't, if you haven't made the investments in cloud-based technologies, private or public cloud, I'm not being... You know, I'm not playing favorites here. I have my opinions, but uh, I think right tool for the right job. Uh, if you're not investing in data platforms where you have rock solid, you know, uh, governance, cleansing, um, lineage, um, understanding of where the data is coming from. And if you're not investing in the risk and compliance side of being able to use data, uh, data for AI in a responsible manner, um, you're only solving half, you know, part of the problem. And so uh, one of the first things we did when we embarked on our AI journey is we set up an enterprise uh, data governance, uh, enterprise AI governance council. Uh, and we brought leaders in from across the enterprise, it's, you know, definitely from our risk and compliance team, um, which we're very lucky to have a very competent team there, uh, but also from the technology and the business units as well. Uh, and what we did is we set very clear guidelines on what we can and cannot do. That eliminates confusion, that, that minimizes, you know, churn within the organization. People who educate themselves on uh, what we're doing in all of these areas as a continuum are able to then self-govern and decide whether they want to take something forward or not. Um, so I would say that setting Creating enabling platforms in a hub and spoke model is, is I, I would never say one model fits everybody, but for us, that's working ex extremely well. So we call it, you know, foundations. We're building foundational capabilities in cloud data and AI. Cloud, we're furthest ahead. We lead the industry in that. Data, everyone is, you know, um, improving what we're doing with our data platforms. Yes. We work with some of the best in the business. And then, of course, with AI. And I think once you create those enabling platforms that create pathways uh, for the rest of the organization to take advantage of these technologies, you then ignite innovation in a way that, you know, you wouldn't if you did everything piecemeal in silos. I see. So you're talking about really developing and uh, improving the foundational capabilities so you can, let's say, kind of unleash the creativity around application and use cases. That's exactly right. Because, you know, if... If, if you're trying to develop an application or use case and you need to start from scratch every time, uh, it becomes too daunting. It becomes too slow. Yeah. And you may not you may not feel like you have the ability to get the funding. You know, it's all about what you put a money where your mouth is. Right. What's most important gets funded. Um, and if we and if we've made that core investment in these foundational platform cap enabling platform capabilities, then we accelerate people's ability across the, and we're, you know, 50,000 people. we got a lot of people who want to do a lot of great things. Um, if you don't unlock that and make it so that, you know, they don't have to worry about all the basics we just talked about, uh, and they can focus on what is it that I need to do with these technologies to solve the user problem that I'm closest to, um, then, you know, we're missing the boat if we don't do that. Such a salient point. So from the bank's perspective, what else can you share about how they should be capitalizing on the latest advancements in data and availability and cleanliness and also the AI applications on top of that? I would say that, you know, first of all, um, invest in your people. Um, and I know I'm being a little, shall we say, provocative here, um, but uh, I think um, it's not like we have you know, everybody across our technology industry knows what the latest advances are in tech. It moves too mm -hmm. fast. Um, so it's funny, um, you know, people forget that investing in your people with a learning and development program 
um, that enables the people you already have and who best understand your systems and your customers, more importantly, is probably the right place to start. Um, and I, and I, you know, as a techie, you probably want to, you probably think I would say, you know, go out and invest in these platforms and invest in technology and, you know, buy all these products that, you know, everyone's trying to throw at us today. Um, but I really think it starts with your people um, and, and making sure that you're empowering them to truly understand what these tools can do and then use their knowledge of your customers to be able to use those tools to create the right product market fit, the right solutions for them. Um, no, nobody in tech uh, can tell you better than you as a bank. I spoke to a bank the other day that had been in business for 121 years. Um, nobody from tech who's been doing AI for a couple of years is going to understand their customer base better than that bank does. Um, that's institutional knowledge that is extremely powerful. And I would, I would challenge our customers to say, bring that to bear. Um, you know, a, a, a good carpenter knows his or her tools and knows what tool to use for the job at hand. What's the right tool for the right job? That hasn't changed in the world of tech, even with all the innovation that's happening out there. So educating our people as we are doing aggressively across the entire enterprise on what these you know, new tools do, what the constraints are, what the, what the advantages are, what are the platforms you need to move fast. Uh, those are some of the things that I think will really um, change, um, help you transform your organization for the future and have a lasting impact. You know, another thing that hasn't changed, even despite all of the advancements, and there have been such, such acceleration in terms of data capabilities, analytics, and of course, AI, all still intending, though, to deliver on the bank's promise to customers, which is to, to know me, value me, and advise me. Those are still the fundamental tenets that banks are trying to deliver. But now we have all of these advancements and capabilities and technologies to better deliver on that, uh, on that purpose. That, as you've said, that's, uh, that's been, uh, you know, it's, it's ingrained in terms of the industry, in terms of what the, the, uh, the, the purpose and the focus of the of banks should be to, to help their customers better deliver on their, uh, their banking needs. Absolutely, Jody. And, you know, um, I'm, I'm so shocked at myself sometimes on like how many financial products I actually use. Um, and, you know, when I was, when I was just coming out of college, uh, I had a bank account um, and that was about it. And, you know, I did the usual checking and savings thing. And now, um, you know, Today, I look at my kids. I have my little um, uh, research lab uh, in my family. I have three kids between the ages of 20 and 26. Uh, what are they, Gen Z now, I think? Um, or Gen X? I, I forget now. Um, but, you know, I look at how they engage with the world of finance, and it's so interesting. Uh, and there's big differences between, you know, my 26-year-old and my 20-year-old, too, in levels of sophistication and understanding uh, in the tools they use. And so I think, you know, our our mandate as an industry is to fit into the lives of this next generation of customers um, as opposed to forcing them into modifying their behaviors into the world that we come from. And that's, for many companies, that's a sea change uh, in how they approach um, their customers. And I think, uh, but it's exciting. It's really exciting. And, and things that you see in the world of, you know, tech software really start to apply. Things like, you know, UX research uh, and, you know, design systems and, and UI development that goes beyond uh, what banks have done in the past. You know, for example, um, one thing I learned in healthcare in my, in my journey through healthcare was when it comes to a digital experience, your average consumer doesn't compare you to others like you. They compare you to the best digital experience they've most recently had. So when the tech companies are constantly pushing the envelope on delivering a great digital user experience, um, we cannot afford to fall behind. We have to exceed that. Yeah, 
So Pardos, you brought up this, uh, this notion of personalizing the experience, really understanding even how different segments and groups want to do their banking and what they need to be able to help solve that. So FIS and Personetics, of course, have a pretty robust partnership now. It's pretty expansive, um, capable of delivering personalized insights, data enrichment, and also savings journeys. And all of this together is intended to help the bank's customers better manage their day-to-day -day banking. In fact, we just had a, an executive from the Bank of Hawaii talk about on a, on a Consumer Bank Association webinar how they're just rolling out the FIS spending insights and their, uh, how optimistic they are in terms of how it, it'll be embraced by customers. So tell me, how are these capabilities around data enrichment and cleansing, creating personalized insights, tailoring savings journeys, how are these of strategic importance for FIS's customers? Jody, first of all, I'm delighted that you use the word journeys um, because it is a journey. Um, and, and again, like I just look at um, my kids and their friends around me and they're just getting started on this journey through life where um, they will have to make so many decisions about exactly the kinds of things you're talking about, right? Um, how do I save for the future? What investments do I make? Um, how do I access the financial tools and resources uh, that make the most sense for me? How do I even know what makes the most sense for me? Uh, and so... If you are going to make a difference in the lives of your customer today, uh, really truly understanding them in a highly personalized manner is not optional anymore. Um, if we can do it in retail, where as you browse the web, it shows you, um, you know, ads for things you might have looked at, you know, just yesterday, um, we absolutely need to do a better job of that in finance. Uh, and that, that transformation is the next big change that is going to happen. And it will use data, it will use AI, it will use platforms, um, but most importantly, it will tie together different parts of a consumer's life. You know, I have a bank that I do a lot with on my, in my personal life, but I don't do everything financial with that bank. I also have financial relationships with a bunch of other vendors too, as a consumer. Yeah. And more and more people are like that. Uh, and so how do you stitch that all together and build a picture that you can then use to help me make decisions that are for the better? And, and the ones who will really win here, I think, are the ones who not only do that, but are able to explain to the consumer what uh, the why behind the recommendations that are being made. Right? Um, you know, it's one thing to be told, hey, based on what you did yesterday, here are the three things I'm going to recommend to you. It's a different thing to say, like, we believe you, this is the phase of life you're in. This is the journey you're in. We see that in things you're doing across the spectrum. And here are three or four things that could make your life better. And here's why. That deeper understanding, almost like having a friendly advisor with you all the time, Doing that at scale with technology is one of the new frontiers that I'm most excited about. Fordhouse, I have to say, I'm, I'm quite impressed that in your role as CTA, CTO, you are able to be so, let's say, empathetic and project, here's what the head of the retail bank should be striving to achieve for, for the customers. So I just want to acknowledge that. And it's actually quite, quite similar to how how we think about things as well. For instance, there's there are there are elements that that banks should be able to provide to customers to take action on right now because they see something. Let's say, for instance, you may have an extra five thousand dollars to put away in your savings, or the al alternate, which is that you may have a cash flow issue in ten days. Okay, that's something that you should take action on right now, and let me advise you of that. But I also recognize that you, let's say, as uh, one of your 20-something-year-old your -year children, is trying to get a better handle on managing their spending, or they're trying to save for their first home. That's not something I just do in one day. That, that journey or that job to be done is a, is a two-year, is a three-year job to be done. So how can I put together the right set of content, advice, tools, 
and products and also progression in terms of, you know, milestone tracking to help you accomplish that goal over time. So it's both having this very near term, like what should the customer take action on right now, but also what you know journey are they on and how can I help them with that? Both of which require a real strong foundational understanding of customer data and then evidence that what I'm sharing with you as a customer, it will personally benefit you. And that also requires the right kind of data to be able to explain why I'm I'm delivering this piece of advice or content or tools or product to you. Yeah, Jody, I, I love those examples because they don't just get to figuring out what to do, but they also talk about how to do it. Um, you know, it, it, look, not too long ago, and even today for, for many banks, um, in that example you gave where you've got, you know, $5,000 sitting in your account and you want to do something useful with that money in the short term, um, how often did we get a notice from our bank saying, hey, would you like to speak to one of our financial advisors? You know what's going to happen if you ask my son, my 26-year-old son, to speak to a financial advisor? Um, he's just never going to do that. Um, now, um, if it was $500,000 and it's sitting in the account of somebody who has worked for 30 years of their life, they might very well be willing and, and in fact, want to speak to a human being about it. And so it's not just developing the insight, but also how you then make it actionable. Um, so, you know, in the moment, giving people the ability to act on it in a way that that relates most to them. That's personalization, too, by the way. Um, that's a big part of what we hope we can do with Personetics, where we say, you know, depending on who this person is, what the, you know, demographic sort of you know, um, segment they belong to. Uh, we might engage with them differently. In healthcare, we called it, you know, next best actions. Um, what is the next best action you want somebody to take to make things better? Can you explain it to them? Can you make it easy to act on? Um, and can you tie it into their long-term journey? Yeah, what's exciting here, even though we are, you know, attempting to really innovate in this space, there's so much more room to improve. Like the ambition we just discussed is one which, I think uh, it sets a higher bar for what FIS and Personetics and other, other platform providers as well, what they should be striving to do to support the banking industry in better serving customers. Absolutely. And yeah. um, I think, you know, getting that real-time feedback loop with customers too is vitally important. Now, the good news yeah. is, you know, digital technology makes it possible to do that. Um, it, it still surprises me, though, how few people do it well. Um, and, and I think that's another big area for improvement. This isn't just about, you know, shooting you an email after you had an interaction with somebody saying, how do we do? Um, there's so many of those coming at us today that like, we can't, we'd be spending half our days just filling out those surveys. Right. Um, yeah, I know. Right. But it's the actions you take without being asked your feedback that really govern, um, you know, how your engagement with that enterprise went, with that brand went. You know, I, I have a, I, I used to know someone who ran um, the customer experience team at Zappos, the shoe seller. And one of the things he had told me, which at that time surprised me, but in hindsight shouldn't surprise anybody, is that when Zappos actually sent the wrong shoe uh, to a customer by mistake, the way they solved their problem made it so that that customer was 40% more likely to be a repeat purchaser from Zappos than not. Think about that. Yeah. The way you handled your mistakes, your screw ups, um, brought that customer back. They didn't have to ask that customer, how did we do? They observed that customer coming back and buying at a much higher rate than customers who got the correct order. That's what I mean by closing that feedback loop in ways that are sort of under the waterline and that are always on. Yeah, that's a great, uh, great story. So finally, for those, what do you think customers will expect from the banking industry in the next three to five years for which the industry is not well prepared? I think they're going to expect um, that you will have an integrated view 
and I, I will have an integrated view, and so will my banking, my financial providers, of everything that I'm doing that is relevant to uh, my business or to my personal finances if I'm an individual customer. Um, and we're not set up well to do that. Um, my bank doesn't know what I'm doing with my credit card, uh, and my credit card doesn't know what I'm doing uh, with my you know, mortgage provider or uh, what I'm doing with my investment manager or my financial advisor. And I think, you know, some people have tried uh, to create a data hub, uh, much like Mint back in the day, uh, where you yep. can see all of your financial data in one place. It kind of works well, but not, not, not great. Um, but I think that consumers are going to be more and more um, eager to work with organizations that don't have a sort of siloed, myopic view of them, but actually understand them in their entirety. Um, and the trick is going to be, how do we do that without being creepy? How do we do that uh, in a way that consumers don't get turned off, but actually understand that we're doing this because we're trying to help you? Again, huge parallel with healthcare. Um, you know, siloed healthcare is one of the reasons why people get into trouble with their health. Um, our body is not a set of independent organisms that don't connect to each other. My financial picture is very much the same. It's, a, it's, a, it's an ecosystem. It's a lot of different things that I'm doing. I want it more real time. I want it more personalized. Uh, I want it to be responsive to my needs uh, as opposed to pushing products on me that I don't even understand, um, you know, why I should be interested. And so I feel like that next wave is going to be cut across these silos, much like FIS's journey as a company. Uh, we came together, we grew very rapidly. This is before I got here, but, you know, I've heard all the stories, acquiring a bunch of companies. Uh, and one of the things Stephanie has really pushed on and if you look at that little circle that we show a lot, you know, it says client centricity, simplicity and innovation. Um, and all three go hand in hand. So we're staying very focused on the client. They want to see one FIS, not a bunch of silos. We need to make it simple to work with us and, we, and, and make our product simpler, too. And then, of course, as a leading tech provider, we need to continue pushing the boundaries on innovation. I think that's very similar to what uh, consumers are going to expect from their financial institutions. Very well said. Well, you know, there's so much more to come that uh, it'll be good to reconnect in a couple of years. Hopefully at that point, there will be tremendous traction, but also we'll be seeing how, how much the industry has advanced around some of these topics we've discussed and see if we've actually been able to deliver on what our ambitions have stated. Yeah, it's, uh, I, I'd be happy to do that, Jody. And it's going to take all of us, right? This is, this is an effort to move the whole industry forward. I don't think exactly. uh, any one company can make all the change that's required. But if we, if we truly you know, lock arms and progress the industry, that rising tide will lift all of our boats. Yeah. And you know, just to that point, you know, what I've seen in, in this industry, I think, uh, really follows suit. It really takes strong leaders to say that even without all the empirical evidence, and now there's just growing empirical evidence around how some of these capabilities can really deliver, but to take a stand around, we have to have a better foundation to understand our customers. They are going to expect more from the bank in terms of more than just delivering products to, real, to delivering really personalized advice and evidence as to why that's going to benefit, from, benefit me. And then back to this idea that you that you laid, that you talked about, which is to do those things well, whatever that might be, whatever those use cases might be, you have to have have laid the right kind of foundation of data analytics, AI capabilities, and then of course it needs to fit within the overall business model. It's not just a digital interaction. There's you know the banker also needs to become more intelligent. Marketing needs to become more precise and more informed and targeted as well. So. You know, it's exciting in terms of what's what's left to be done, but it's uh, it's also rewarding to have some very strong banking industry leaders, which we both have the benefit of working with to help lead the charge. Yeah, that's very well said. And, you know, I will say that uh, 
I often think, um, and I hear from from people who um, may be starting out in their financial journeys, um, everybody needs guidance at some point. Everybody needs personalized advice. That shouldn't just be the domain of people who can afford to hire a financial advisor or you know, have a certain amount of money in the bank. Um, we need to, you know, we will change the world for the better um, when people are able to make financial decisions, you know, being better informed with the right tools, with the right um, guidance and advice, uh, and with their best interests in mind, which is, you know, paramount for all of us. Great. Well, for that was Bettina. Thank you so much for joining us on the Banking on Innovation podcast. I know the audience enjoyed your perspective. And thank you again. Thank you, Jody. It's been a real pleasure being here, and we'll talk soon. Thank you for joining another episode of Banking on Innovation. Make sure you subscribe to get future podcast episodes. Please follow us on LinkedIn and at personetics.com.